have some mainly shoulder and knee cases. Um, uh, some of them are what you see every day and some of them are a little more com complex. Um, how about this one? Okay, I hear supraspinatus there and that's indeed true. So you are here, you have fluid sensitive sequences, sagittal and coronal. <clears throat> Um, what you have here is a focal high signal which uh, approaches fluid signal uh, in the uh, inner aspect of the supraspinatus tendon, uh, quite anterior, it's at the footprint of the supraspinatus tendon. Uh, so what type of pair is this? Yeah, it's a partial tear, so anything more specific? Okay, I hear Rembrandt tear. Okay, uh, it is indeed a Rembrandt tear. Um, Rembrandt tear is just a fancy name for an articular surface tear um, at the footprint, of the inner aspect of the uh, supraspinatus. Um, now, you know, some people call it pasta lesions. I'm really not in favor of too many names, but if you said this is an articular surface tear, that is good enough. Um, just a couple of things I want to mention about um, tendinopathy and tears. Uh, what you have here is intermediate signal in the supraspinatus, so which tells you the supraspinatus is uh, not completely normal, um, which we call tendinosis or tendinopathy. We don't want to use, as radiologists, uh, the term tendinitis, which means inflammation, that's a clinical term, because when you look under the microscope, these tendons do not have any uh, inflammatory cells. Basically, this is a process of aging. Um, you will have mucoid degeneration and some fibrosis, uh, which produces intermediate signal. And you see that in uh, most of the patients over 40, indefinitely over 50. So this is an articular surface tear, also called a Rembrandt tear, like one of you mentioned. How about this one? Same patient. Same patient. Same patient. Let's go back again. All these images have some finding or another. Any takers? Okay. Uh, this patient here had a history of dislocation. You can see that the patient is fairly young. You can see the physis pretty well. Um, here uh, you have a hill sac deformity. And the inferior glenoid does not look normal, does it? And then you have a lot of fluid inferiorly. Um, actually, it looks like there is almost a um, you know a bone piece missing in the inferior glenoid, and on the sagittal image, you can see uh, the bony fragment more anteriorly. On the axial images, once again, you see that that uh, you really um, don't visualize the anterior inferior labrum, and you have some kind of a gamush of a, a tissue here which is probably partly anterior labrum, periosteum, and uh, in this particular slice you're not seeing the bone. So this is a hill sac deformity and an anterior um, inferior labral tear or a bank art lesion. Um, Anterior inferior labral tears are uh, divided into uh, and called different types depending on what's torn or what's displaced or not. The typical bank card lesion 
has uh, labral tear and displacement and also tear of the periosteum, P stands for the periosteum. Uh, these uh, nice illustrations are taken by Ratsor. Uh, by the way, this is really a good site for uh, MSK MR. Um, if you want to look at examples of uh, any particular MSK pathology. And so this is a typical Bancart lesion. And um, when you have the periosteum uh, that is intact with just the labral tear, without a significant displacement that is called a Perthes lesion. Um, when you have displacement of the labrum, but the periosteum is still attached, um, that is an ulcer lesion. An ulcer lesion can be either acute or chronic. Uh, chronic lesions tend to be fibrous and kind of tagged on to the glenoid medially. Um, this, uh, here are some examples. Uh, this is a, a typical bank art lesion. You see that uh, this labrum is uh, standing alone by itself. There is no attachment by the periosteum. Uh, but these lesions can be difficult to diagnose in non-contrast uh, images or MR orthogram images. Um, even with MR orthograms, if there is no labral uh, displacement, uh, it could be difficult in neutral position. So this is an Aber image or abduction extent, uh, external rotation uh, with the patient's uh, <clears throat> hand being under the head and the arm abducted and up. Um, so you have the anterior labrum here and undercutting of the anterior labrum which forces the fluid in the Aber position um, to the detached, under the detached labrum. All right, uh, next case. This is pretty obvious, isn't it? So this is a typical extensive full thickness, uh, you, may, you may almost call full width there of the uh, supraspinatus. I showed this case uh, mainly to talk about different types of tears, uh, sagittal images, coronal images, the things you want to describe. Uh, you want to mention the width of the fluid gap, if there is a retraction, which there is in this case. Uh, many of the large full thickness tears uh, will have retractions. Sometimes large partial thickness tears can also have retraction. Um, when you say full thickness there, what we mean is uh, there is fluid signal through and through in the craniocardial direction. Okay, it could be a very small focal tear, so even a full thickness tear need not have retraction. Uh, when we talk about width, we are talking about the uh, fluid gap in the anterior posterior dimension. Um, here you can see uh, basically um, the entire width of the supraspinatus thin tendon um, has fluid signal in it. So this is a, a large full thickness, nearly full width pair of the supraspinatus. Here is your subscapularis, here is your intraspinatus. Okay. How about this one? I'm sorry? Um, not really. Patient has a um, rotator cuff tear. An older patient has um, a a really um, overgrown, you know, like hypertrophic AC joint, and you see some fluid in the AC joint. Actually, this patient came not only with shoulder pain, you can actually see the marker here, a lump on the superior aspect of the shoulder. So um, then there is this fluid collection here. This is our marker here uh, above the um, AC joint. So. Um, 
This is what we call a geyser phenomena or geyser shoulder. Uh, the postulation is uh, when there is a <clears throat> full thickness tear of the rotator cuff, the fluid kind of dissects through into the AC joint with age, the AC capsule weakens and allows fluid to get in. So the fluid kind of like insinuates through the capsule into the AC joint and out through the capsule and becomes subcutaneous and like a palpable lump. And um, someone thought that it resembles a geyser. This is one of the world's most um, famous geysers, the Old Faithful in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, you must see it if you uh, visit U.S. <laughs> it's really something to watch. Anyway, this is called, you know, because it resembles like something erupting out of the AC joint called a geyser phenomenon. Fancy name for something uh, very benign. Okay, uh, when we are looking at RC tears or shoulders for rotator cuff tears, um, I just want to mention a couple of things that we want to pay attention to when you are looking at these images. You want to make sure you look at the AC joint in the axial view and also make sure your images go superior um, to the AC joint and cover the entire AC joint because you want to see if there is an osochromialy or not. And uh, when uh, rotator cuff repairs are done, this is something that the surgeon would like to know if there is an osochromialy because there's, um, surgery would be slightly uh, different and they do a, a chromioplasty uh, with patients with osochromiali. And um, when you see intramuscular cysts like this um, in a shoulder image, you want to look carefully for rotator cuff tears. Um, the, uh, especially the articular surface tears uh, tend to dissect uh, through the tendon and can appear as a focal a fluid trail collections um, within the uh, muscle or musculotendinous junction. So intramuscular uh, cysts, uh, whenever you look at uh, them in the rotator cuff muscles, look for tears carefully. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, um, when you uh, look at the oblique coronal images, make sure your technologist obtain the coronal oblique images along the long axis of the supracinatus tendon. These are our axial images. Um, the oblique coronal images should be obtained um, along the long axis of the rotator cuff tendon so that you can uh, visualize the uh, tears, um, you know, to the best advantage. And also the patient should uh, be either in neutral position or a slight external rotation because internal rotation uh, kind of uh, <clears throat> masks the uh, anterior fibers of the articular surface. Uh, so you want the patient in at least neutral position, if not slightly external rotation. How about this one? Uh, this is just a reminder. Uh, for us, not to forget about the bones when we are looking at uh, MSK MR. Uh, this is an example of extensive marrow infiltration in a patient with multiple myeloma. A uh, couple of things about marrow. Uh, you want to have at least a P1 weighted sequence in your protocols uh, so that you can evaluate the marrow along with the fluid sensitive sequences. Uh, and in adult patients, rarely uh, does normal red marrow replace the epiphyseal region. Um, usually it stops at the physial line, the typical um, red marrow conversion that you see in uh, typical middle-aged females. So if you see replacement um, in the epiphysis, you have to be worried. And there are several um, tricks that people use and uh, several guidelines people use 
Some people talk about convex versus concave margin. Just remember that nothing is 100%. Uh, Mayo Clinic also has recommended using um, um, in-phase and out-of-phase images. Um, so if there is a drop in signal in the out-of-phase images, then most of the times it's a benign pathology versus, um, you know, malignant pathology where there is no fat, therefore there is not going to be any drop in signal. Once again, you know, remembering uh, that none of this is 100%, but it can help you guide um, through uh, evaluating the marrow given the history. Uh, this is uh, in contrast to what we looked at before. This is the normal marrow, which is fatty and bright on T1, and uh, normal marrow on T2 weighted sequences. All right. Um, okay, just uh, take a quick look at this clip. What do you think? Okay. Anything else? I agree. What is it doing? Is it doing anything? One second. Let me just stop where I think the finding is. There you go. Okay. I completely agree with you. Where is this paralabral cyst? In the what anatomic location? Okay. Okay. Um, actually, it's in the spinal glenoid notch. Here is the anterior border of the glenoid, posterior. This is the supraspinatus, infraspinatus. This is the cyst here. This is the infraspinatus muscle. Here is minor. You see the signal of the infraspinatus. There is edema in the infraspinatus muscle. Uh, look at the low signal of the rest of the muscles here. And actually, this portion more anteriorly is the suprascapular notch. So let's just review the anatomy of the scapula. Um, you have two notches in the scapula. This is the spine of the scapula, anterior aspect coracoid process, right? Um, so this portion here where the spine attaches to the body, which is posterior, is the spinal glenoid notch. And this more anterior, um, more gentle concavity here is the suprascapular notch. So um, what we saw was a large spinal glenoid notch which can which was kind of coming out anteriorly and can come into the suprascapular notch. So what do we care, right? Like what if it's there? Um, but a couple of things can happen when these uh, cysts get to a sizable um, volume like we saw before. Um, you can get suprascapular neuropathy. Okay, just to review, uh, here is the suprascapular nerve, which is mainly derived from C5, C6. It's both a sensory and a motor nerve, as you know. And it travels from anterior to posteriorly. So uh, from the brachial plexus, it enters the scapula under the transverse scapular ligament, gives off a motor branch to the supraspinatus muscle, and then scoots under this uh, spinal glenoid notch, uh, right, anterior to the spine, and then gives off branches to the infraspinatus muscle. It also gives sensory branches to the shoulder joint and the AC joint. So what we saw was uh, a spinal glenoid notch cyst, which is compressing upon the suprascapular nerve, causing infraspinatus edema but not supraspinatus because uh, this 
uh, innervation has already occurred. But if it gets large enough and starts compressing the suprascapular nerve more superiorly and anteriorly, then both the supraspinatus and infraspinatus may be involved. So um, just by looking at the location and also what it is doing to the muscles it supplies, you can figure out, um, you know, um, what this particular entity is. Um, while we are talking about neuropathies, I also wanted to talk about, um, you know, just review the axillary nerve anatomy. You can also get what we call quadrilateral face uh, syndrome, which is compression of the axillary nerve. The quadrilateral space is bounded by the uh, <clears throat> medial aspect of the humerus laterally, uh, triceps medially, teres minor superiorly, teres major inferiorly, and uh, a typically, axillary neuropathy can occur in trauma. There could be fibrous bands or ganglion cysts, such as in this case. And um, what you see is teres minor issues, uh, either edema or atrophy, depending on at what time point you uh, image these patients. Um, this diagram, again, illustrates the uh, relationship of the suprascapular nerve here, and here is the axillary nerve. Okay, this is another lady with um, pain and limited range of motion of her shoulder. No video clips for this. Any guesses? I'll give you a clue. Rotator cuff looks pretty good, doesn't it? Okay, this patient also has the same pathology. Someone else. Slightly more obvious. Okay. Okay, last chance. I can't hear you. What we are looking at here is the region of the coracohumeral ligament. And normally, you should have fat signal behind the coracoid process. Uh, what we see here in the fluid-sensitive sequence is a lot of edema, inflammatory changes in the region of the coracohumeral ligament and the subcoracoid fat. And the axillary recess is also quite thickened. Same thing in the previous case here, somewhat thickened coracohumeral ligament, and the fat is a face with inflammatory changes in the region of the subcoracoid fat. So th this is adhesive capsulitis. This is something which is not such an obvious finding unless you're kind of thinking about it. So whenever a patient comes with severe shoulder pain but there is no rotator cuff there, usually typically middle-aged um, patients, women more than men. So this is just to illustrate a normal coracohumeral ligament with normal subcoracoid fat signal here on T1 weighted images, and uh, this is a patient with adhesive capsulitis. Please let me know whenever you want me to stop. I understand it's late. Everyone is tired and hungry. So you just have to put your arms up and we'll stop.
Again, selected images from the same video clip. Not sure if it's projecting. Okay. Any guesses on this? This is a young patient who had um, a dislocation of the shoulder and um, had uh, chronic pain since then. Okay. I'm just going to show you the findings on the static images. We have a loose body, it looks like, in the posterior recess. And uh, whenever you see a loose body, you have to wonder whether it's a cartilaginous fragment, osteochondral fragment, where is it coming from? Uh, and I'm not sure if you can appreciate this is an MR orthogram. This is the contrast fluid that is very bright. The gray signal right underneath is the glenoid cartilage. You want, especially in a young patient, the glenoid cartilage to be uh, uniform and smooth of reasonable thickness, but you have a focal cartilage defect here, um, a fluid filling in uh, where the glenoid cartilage should be. So uh, this patient has a um, cartilaginous fragment or so-called GLAD lesion. He also had, I'm not quite sure again if it is projecting, uh, has a, a superior labral tear. I think you can see it much better here. Um, see the superior labrum looks very irregular. There is an irregular linear signal which is extending laterally towards the humerus. And there is also undercutting of the superior labrum. So some people call it double Oreo cookie sign or um, something like that. So the, this patient has a, a slap tear. Um, and also a glenolabral articular disruption or a GLAD lesion, in other words, cartilaginous disruption of the glenoid. Um, uh, just to review the slab tears, um, slab tears are quite common um, in addition to um, dislocations. The typical uh, mechanism is fall on an outstretched flexed hand. Um, slap one is considered n not really a tear, but just fraying at the superior labrum. Slap two being a tear with no displacement. Slap three, a bucket handle tear, which is what I believe this patient has. And slap four is a tear extending into the biceps. Now they have, a, you know, um, classification up to slab 10 depending on whether it extends more inferiorly to the anterior inferior labrum or posteriorly or whether it extends to the middle glenohumeral ligament and so on and so forth. Suffice to say that as long as you describe the extent of the lesion, I don't think you have to memorize all different types of um, slab tears. These are the classic four types that everyone talks about most of the time. So um, let's move on to some knee cases. Take a look at the coronal, and um, I'm going to play the video clip just one more time. Sometimes it's really hard to you know, figure out all the abnormalities with just looking at it for a few seconds on a video. Um, however, let me let me know what you think 
this patient has. I'm sorry? ACL tear, I heard PCL tear, anything else? Medial meniscus, okay. Uh, medial meniscus is right here. Looks pretty um, okay to me. Actually, I'm more worried about the lateral meniscus. Look at this, like what is this tongue of tissue? It just does not look normal. Here it looks truncated, looks like there's a little signal here. Okay. Same patient. Here you have anterior tibial translation, so which means the patient has ACL tear. Not necessarily in all ACL tears you see anterior tibial translation on MR imaging. Typically, if it is uh, more than seven millimeters, uh, the posterior border of uh, the lateral femoral condyles to the tibia at the level of the lateral gastroc tendon, um, then you can be confident that it's anterior tibial translation. And uh, typically, patients who have anterior tibial translations, um, although not always, have um, lateral, posterolateral capsular and posterolateral coronary injuries. Um, in addition to that, you have signal, longitudinal signal in the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. And um, basically, the posterior horn is kind of divided into anterior and posterior fragments, right? So this is called a Risberg rip. Um, basically, what happens is the posterior aspect of the lateral meniscus is tethered by the ligament of Risberg or the meniscal femoral ligament, and the um, <clears throat> Posterior root tethers the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus to sphere, and because of the anterior translation, the lateral meniscus just kind of, you know, when during the tibial translation, the anterior portion of the posterior horn just rips forward, and that's what is called the Risberg rip. So this is not only uh, the ACL is torn. There is also a tongue of tissue anteriorly. Um, this does not belong to the lateral meniscus. Um, this is just kind of laying there where the ACL should be. So this is not only an ACL tear, this is ACL stump entrapment. Um, ACL stumps can get entrapped in the um, intercondylar notch or anteriorly like this. This is also something important uh, for you to communicate to the surgeon so when they go arthroscopically they know what to expect because they will have to uh, resect this portion before um, you know they go and repair the ACL. So the PCL actually in this patient is uh, normal. You may have a little buckling of the PCL because of the ACL uh, tear, but the PCL is normal as you can see here. Um, we don't have the posterior most images going to its tibial attachment. Here is your PCL. Here is your PCL coming into the uh, condylar attachment, but you really don't see any ACL. And here is the trapped fragment of the ACL. So this patient had not only an ACL tear with stump entrancement, lateral meniscal tear, and also an MCL sprain. Here you see that you don't see the normal fibers except in this single image of the MCL. and also had the typical associated bone bruise of the um, posterolateral tibia and the lateral femoral condyle. Should we go on? Stop. One more. 
Okay, and then now I'm going to move. Okay, let's do this. Last case. MBA two months ago. Our typical uh, Philadelphia body habitus. Any takers? Anyone heard of this? All this is is an internal shear injury or an internal degloving injury. Um, this uh, can appear as a mass acutely or um, increasing swelling over a short period of time or over several weeks. Basically, um, 